This is the Curtis Wright XP-55 Ascender. It was an experimental World War II interceptor, and one that looked like it was built by somebody with a personal hatred of lateral stability. With its engine at the back, and the elevator, which is normally found on the tail at the front, it's no wonder that this aircraft is often nicknamed the Ars Ender. In fact, this was almost certainly the intention of Curtis Wright engineer Edward Flesch. Usually, the US government was careful about the naming of aircraft, shying away with horror at anything vaguely comical, but through some happy stroke he snuck the name through, with one theory suggesting he told them it was pronounced Ascender. Posterior-related monikers aside, this was a daring attempt at producing a new and innovative aircraft, and it was certainly a marked departure from the cautious but capable Curtis P-40. But before we delve into the weird history of this even weirder plane, I'd like to talk about Squarespace, who are the sponsors of today's video, and whose service allowed me to create my website. If you've been following along with these, you'll know that Squarespace provides an excellent service that allows you to build your own website, be it personal or professional, and I've been using it to build a website that I plan to use extensively moving into the new year. One thing I plan to do a lot more in the future is attend air shows and various events, so I figured I'd create a page where I can share my photos and experiences from said events after I've been to them. Thankfully, Squarespace has a pre-built template for events that suits my needs perfectly. To my shame, I've only been able to attend one air show this year, which was here in Brisbane. Poor health prevented me from attending two others, and this year I didn't quite have the money to get a last minute ticket for Oshkosh. However, I still got some good photos. Once you've set up the event, you can create internal pages linked to them, so for me I used that as an easy way to nest all of the photos I managed to take. You also have the option to add video links and text as well, but I went to the air show more for my own fun rather than to document it, and doing a write-up so long after it wouldn't really do it much credit. Once the photos were in, it was just a case of fiddling around with font and sizing for a few minutes, and the page was complete. Nice and easy. And once I've been to other air shows, I'll simply be able to repeat the process, all of which only took about 15 minutes or so. Now if you want to have a go at setting up your own website, be it for personal or business use, head over to Squarespace today for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash rexushanger to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video, which by the way is directly funding my trip to America next year, yes, officially announced I am going to the States, the many photos of which will go up on my website. And now, let's get back to the XP-55 Ascender. I mean, Ascender. I mean, the plane. The XP-55 was born out of the same design competition that gave us the Volte XP-54 and the Northrop XP-56. In late 1939, the US Army was looking for the next generation of fighter aircraft, and they were keen to encourage innovative thinking. So, along with the competitions that gave us things like the P-38, the P-47, and the P-51, they sought out designs that were a bit less conventional. And boy, oh boy, did they get what they asked for. A while ago, we covered the XP-54, and in the future we will look at the XP-56, but for now, our focus is on Curtis Wright. Their proposal was one of the last designs initiated by chief designer Donovan Berlin, before he moved on to work on the Fisher P-75, which is a nice way of saying that he disagreed with Curtis so thoroughly on the proposed improvements to address the sluggishness of the flagging P-40 that he left the company in frustration, but that's a story for another day. He proposed a radical design which is not exactly what you see on the screen here, as none of the original drawings seem to exist, but this serves to mostly illustrate what he envisioned. It featured a rear-mounted engine, which would drive a pusher propeller. It had swept-back rear-mounted wings in place of a traditional tail boom arrangement. Vertical stabilizers would be mounted on the wings themselves, about two-thirds of the way out, which is different than what you see here and pitch control was to be achieved by an all-flying elevator in the nose. Some call this a canard. Indeed, I often call this a canard myself for the sake of simplicity, but it's technically not a canard as it has no fixed surface. 
Power was to be delivered by the newly developed Continental I-1430, often known as the Hyper Engine, which was a 23-litre, 12-cylinder inverted V12, which was hoped to provide around 1,600 horsepower at takeoff. This itself was to drive a contra-rotating propeller. Sources seem to be a bit shaky on these specific types of blades, but two sets of three seem to be the general consensus. However, all of this is a moot point, as for reasons we will later get into, the use of said engine and the contra-rotating propellers never made it into the physical design of the XP-55. That being said, a pusher design did persist, and with it came a problem when it came to bailing out, as there was a serious risk of the pilot falling into the propeller disc and, well, turning into many pieces. Because of this, Curtis engineer W. J. Peterson designed a system that allowed the pilot to jettison the propeller before bailing out. This was approved for the design of the subsequent XP-55, becoming one of its many novel features. Donovan Berlin initially proposed a mixed but potent armament. This consisted of one 30 caliber machine gun, two 50 caliber machine guns, and a 30mm cannon, much like the one seen on the Bell P-39. All of these were to be mounted in the nose, with the pilot's cockpit located a little further aft. Compared to many other fighters at the time, this would have provided for excellent forward visibility for gunnery, as this little bit of footage here demonstrates. Rear visibility was a bit more questionable, but that just gave the pilot more encouragement to not get an enemy on his six. All in all, Berlin's proposal was as impressive as it was innovative. If put into production, it would be the first swept-wing fighter to see service with the United States, and the Army Air Corps, which was pleased with the plucky P-40 now entering service, issued a contract for preliminary engineering data, which meant a trip to the wind tunnel. Curtis agreed to several performance metrics with this contract. A top speed of 507 miles an hour at 20,000 feet, a climb to said altitude of no more than 5 minutes, and an endurance of approximately 90 minutes, which might not sound very much, but they were only designing an interceptor. As with many less conventional designs, the wind tunnel was often a herald of woe, promising many long nights of revisions at the workshop and a multitude of headaches to go with it, and in the case of the XP-55, this was no different. Wind tunnel tests showed various undesirable characteristics, particularly poor lateral stability, and the most worrisome of which was a tendency to enter an inverted flat spin after a stall. Because of this, the Air Corps were reluctant to pursue further development, especially with the war in Europe escalating, which itself put demand on the rapid development of more conventional designs. But the design team were persistent. Edward Bud Flesch, who was the project manager, convinced Curtis to fund their own development of a full-scale flying testbed, with which they would gather additional data to perfect the flight model. This became known as the Curtis Wright Model 24-B. As it was built to test streamlining and aerodynamics, its construction was basic. The fuselage was made entirely of steel tubing covered in fabric, and the wings were made entirely of wood. No photos seem to exist of this model in its original form, but when first completed, its vertical surfaces and rudders were installed midway along the wing, and to help maintain airflow in the stall, the wing had slots mid-cord in the outer panels, along with washout. Completed with a fixed landing gear and powered by a measly 270 horsepower Manasco engine, it could barely reach 200 miles an hour, but speed was never its purpose, so that wasn't really an issue. The aircraft flew for the first time on the 2nd of December 1941, with test pilot J. Harvey Gray at the controls, and following this, it was put through an extensive testing program. As per the wind tunnel tests, the directional stability of the prototype left much to be desired, particularly during low-speed aerobatic manoeuvres. A number of changes were introduced to correct this. The vertical stabilisers were made larger and moved out to the wingtips. Additional vertical surfaces were then added to the top and the bottom of the engine cowling, and finally, the wings were further extended beyond the vertical fins, to give the final shape that makes the aircraft so recognisable today. An additional change, not related to handling performance, was also made, which involved raising the nose gear strut to improve the takeoff run. 
In this new form, flight handling improved dramatically, and although there were still a few things to work out, the Army issued a contract for the production of three prototype fighters under the designation of XP-55. By this point, Donovan Berlin had moved on from Curtis, and the project was now in the hands of Augustus Page Jr. and Edward Flesch. Like the modified version of the flying testbed, their design of the XP-55 featured several differences from Berlin's original proposal. Some of these were direct improvements, such as the aerodynamic changes, but some of the changes were unfortunately forced onto them. The biggest of these was a change in power plant. The Continental I-1430 had failed to live up to expectations, and the decision was made to re-engine the XP-55 with the Allison V-1710. This was not ideal, as mentioned in the recent P-40 video, this engine lacked power at high altitudes, which made it a poor choice for an interceptor. However, the designers hoped that a more powerful engine would be available by the time production would begin, and they stressed this point to the army to temper their expectations. Additionally, revisions were made to the armament. The 37mm cannon was first deleted, with the design switching to 250 caliber machine guns and to 20mm cannons instead, though this was changed again before completion to a set of 450 caliber machine guns ostensibly to save weight, but it was also a reflection of the army's dogged preference for the 50 caliber weapon over the emerging cannon designs. In consequence of this, the estimated performance figures were revised. Top speed was reduced to 419 miles an hour at 19,300 feet, a climb to that altitude would now take just over 7 minutes, and the endurance was revised down to just 1 hour. The reduced engine performance was a disappointment, though several powerful engines were now on their way, including the Packard Merlin. All the XP-55 had to do was prove that it was worthy of such an upgrade. It was also around this time that Bud Flesh snuck the name Ascender past the review board, much to the future amusement of aviation enthusiasts for decades to come. Unfortunately, things got off to a pretty rough start for the Ascender. The first XP-55 was completed on the 26th of June 1943 and brought to Scott Field in Missouri. This airfield was chosen as the takeoff run was expected to be poor. These expectations were correct, as test pilot J. Harvey Gray quickly found out. He reported a strong reluctance of the XP-55 to even get off the ground. In fact, it lifted off dangerously close to the end of the runway. The aircraft was also difficult to manage on the ground as well, as the engine developed a tendency to overheat during taxiing and ground testing, and having an engine that wants to destroy itself before it's even airborne is rarely ideal. To address the takeoff problem, and thus prevent the XP-55 from ploughing headlong into the barriers at the end of the runway, the area of the nose-mounted elevator was increased by 15%. Along with this, it was set up so that when the flaps were lowered for takeoff, some level of positive trim was set to the elevator to help increase lift. To address the problem with engine cooling, the ventral air intake was revised not once, but twice. Though, unfortunately, this didn't completely solve the issue. However, the cooling problems of the first XP-55 didn't last too long as just a few weeks later it was a crumpled wreck on the ground. By November, the test program had moved on to Lambert Field, and despite some continued overheating problems, the performance of the XP-55 looked promising. There were some lingering concerns with stability though, and part of the testing at Lambert Field was to evaluate the XP-55's stalling characteristics. During one of these stall tests on the 15th of November, with the gear and the flaps down, the XP-55 stalled out, and made the distressing decision to flip over backwards, a full 180 degrees, and stay there. Now on its back, and somewhat resembling a distressed tortoise, it could not right itself, and the aircraft plunged over 16,000 feet, spinning upside down the entire way. Thankfully, Gray was able to bail out safely, but the XP-55 was completely wrecked, and this alarming behaviour threatened to contail all future development. At the time of the crash, the second XP-55 was already far along in its construction. Because of this, minimal changes could be made to its airframe. 
It featured a larger elevator, a modified elevator tab system, and the ailerons had spring tabs installed in place of balance tabs. The second XP-55 made its first flight on the 9th of January 1944, but it was restrained from entering any conditions that might threaten the stall encountered by its predecessor. The third XP-55 featured more radical changes. The wing area was increased by extensions at the wingtips, elevator travel was increased from 17 to 70 degrees up and down, and so-called trailerons were added to the extended wingtips to expand the control services and prevent a reduction in roll rate. It was this aircraft that properly resumed the test program in April of 1944, and, much like the first, it encountered problems from the outset. On the very first takeoff, the high elevator angle caused wing stalling, which dramatically increased the takeoff run. To correct this, a travel stop was added which limited the elevator to 17 degrees, unless the aircraft was inverted, which allowed the XP-55 to get airborne again. Once airborne, it proved to be overly sensitive at slow speeds, which proved most distressing during landing approaches in anything other than perfect conditions. And then there were the stall tests. When these resumed, it proved to be almost more dangerous than the first model. Test pilots reported that there was zero warning before the XP-55 stalled, and when it did so, it was abrupt, usually characterised by a sickening roll and a sharp downward pitch, with the recovery from the stall taking so long that the aircraft had lost nearly 4,000 feet before it had fully recovered. Because of this, a pressure sensor was installed that drove a shaking device attached to the control stick, which became one of the first artificial stall warning systems used in practice. Though this did work, the problem of altitude loss proved to be difficult to solve, and the thought of the XP-55 stalling out at altitudes below 10,000 feet made many uneasy about its future. By September 1944, the troubled third prototype was joined by the second, which had been suitably modified with the same design changes. If stalling was avoided, both aircraft handled remarkably well at medium and high speeds, and, had they been powered by a more potent engine, they could have proven to be excellent performers. However, the Allison V-1710 held the XP-55 back. The maximum speed was a disappointing 377 miles an hour, cooling problems were proving to be a menace, and even the weaponry had become a headache. During weapon trials on the third XP-55, the gun mounts failed under load, and the blast tubes collapsed after firing tests. The armament was subsequently removed whilst Curtis worked on redesigning the mounts, which threatened a complete redesign of the nose, and in the meantime, the third XP-55 was sent on to Wright Field for use in public displays. The accommodation of the armament was never realised, however, as shortly after this, the development of the aircraft was terminated. The Army considered the XP-55 to be unacceptable in almost all metrics. The stall characteristics were far too dangerous, even with the artificial warning system. The top speed was disappointing, even taking into consideration the underpowered engine. The takeoff run was an excessive 5,000 feet long in good conditions. And the whole airframe was over 1,000 pounds overweight, which compounded all of the aforementioned problems even more. Because of this, the benefits of the XP-55's unusual design were far outweighed by its deficiencies. Additionally, its development had been delayed so much that the jet engine was now coming into play, which rendered the possibility of production P-55s all but impossible. As if to crown the monumental failure of what began as a promising program, the third XP-55 was then lost at Wright Field in May of 1945. With no further purpose, it was used for some minor testing and was then flown at one of the air shows held there by the Army Air Force. Following a formation flight with a P-38 Lightning and a P-51 Mustang, which would have been a unique sight with the XP-55 flying as the lead, its pilot, William Glasgow, attempted to put the aircraft through a low-speed roll. The aircraft's low-speed instability came back to haunt it, and Glasgow lost control. The crash not only killed him, but debris also resulted in the injury of multiple people and the death of at least one motorist that had been struck by the burning wreckage. This tragic end left the second XP-55 as the sole remaining aircraft. 
Following the crash at Wright Field, this XP-55 was only flown once or twice, probably as ferry flights, before being grounded and given to the National Air Museum in Washington. Today, following an extensive restoration program, it can be found on display at the Air Zoo in Michigan, a place that I desperately want to visit when I finally get around to visiting the United States, which will hopefully be next autumn, all plans permitting. Had the XP-55 been powered by a more powerful engine, it may have found better success. Having more power on hand would certainly have helped if it got into trouble at slow speed, but the design of the airframe was probably the main issue. In an age where computer-assisted controls and stability didn't exist, barely even theoretically, its aerodynamic properties were simply too complex for a human pilot and regular controls to manage at the time. That being said, it remains a striking example of just how unorthodox some designs were getting in the mid-1940s, something that would be carried on into the dawning jet age. And for its looks alone, the XP-55 is one of my all-time favourite aircraft. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons, whose names you see here. Um, I apologise for my absence recently, a few different things have cropped up in my personal life, mostly due to my health, which got in the way of things, but hopefully, moving forwards, things will be back to normal. And I hope everyone enjoyed my little 3D animations that I included today. Stay tuned for more of those in the future. I'll provide a better update on that in the upcoming Q&A video. A huge thank you as well to the Wing Commanders, the highest tier members whose names have also been on the screen here. Hopefully I've not missed anyone. If I have, I'll be sure to give you a shout out in the following video. But that's all for today. Thank you all so much, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.